Hey, what is up, you guys? That is Tyler. Welcome back, back, back to the Tyler Williams channel. Welcome to another video. This is your May Young Classic review. We are into the semifinals of the May Young Classic. It has been a great tournament so far. I'd say it would. It is a. Uh, I'd say it's better than the last tournament. Not by much, but I'd say it is. I definitely match quality wise. I think there's been a lot more better matches this time around than it was last year. Uh, we had some good matches tonight, and one that was just had a very sad ending to it, and it was very upsetting seeing that. But we'll get to it when we get to it. So the first match we had was Mako Sadamore versus Lacey Lane. I went into it like, yeah, this is gonna be great, especially because Mako Sadamore she's just been having great matches all around. So I'm like, yeah, it doesn't matter who she's in the ring with, sure she can have a great match with just about anybody at this point. So the two had a very nice standoff sequence where they're like trying to hit each other you guys know it's it's new japan shit like they're trying to hit each other but they can't now they're doing acrobatic shit lacy lane busted out some uh cartwheel um i think it all i think it all started because like she didn't shake mako's hand and mako kind of ended the whole sequence with like a hard-hitting corkscrew roundhouse kick to the face of lacy that just like it, that shit like it, it rattled her for a second but she got up good stuff from both women like they they went at it for, I think, a good, like, nine or ten minutes. Lacey Lane, I don't know how long she's been wrestling, but she, she held her own against Mako. It didn't look like she was being carried the whole match, which sometimes, you know, you could tell when a woman is more experienced than the other, but she held her own, which is good. Mako Sadamora finished off the match with a roundhouse kick to the face and followed that up with her, I don't know if she calls it the Mako driver or not, but the fireman's carry for the pin. So Mako Sadamora is going to be making it on to the semifinals, and... I am pretty excited for whoever she might be facing, you know. Either person, either Tony Storm or me, am, I would be, I'd be hyped for, but I'm not going to spoil it just yet. So then we get on to the next match. The match I was also very excited for, Io Shirai versus Deanna Perrazzo. Both women are just extremely talented. Io Shirai, one of the greatest wrestlers in the world, male or female. Deanna Perrazzo, very much an uppercomer. Um, Deanna Perrazzo got a lot of offense in, in this match. More than I thought she would get in. And I guess that was, I guess that kind of put the seat in my head that, you know, Io's going to dominate because of how dominant she was in her match against Zia Brookside and like the, the entry, the, what, is it the entry level, like part of the tournament since 32 is not the qualifying one? I don't know. Anyway, that kind of set the stone for like her having a dominant performance in the tournament. But no, Diana, she got in some drop kicks. She did a one, she did the Kushida cartwheel drop kick, which was pretty cool. She had in her uh, Fujiwara, which is her finish, she had to lock in at least like two or three times at some point. One point she had locked in the first time. I didn't think she was getting out of it. Then she got locked in the second time, and she had like both her arms locked in, and uh, Io got out of it. Then she managed to uh, hit a trio of German suplexes, better than I have ever seen Brock Lesnar hit a trio of German suplexes. Let me just put that out the way. She then went into a Fujiwara immediately after a pinfall attempt. Like, after the trio of German suplexes, she went for the pin. Io kicks out. She went immediately into the Fujiwara armbar, which I thought was a smart move. And she had... Io was in this move for, like, a... She was in this move for a hot minute. Now, I didn't think for a second that Io Shirai was tapping out. Nor did I think she was going to lose. But she... I didn't think she was going to tap out. And she got out of this. But she got out of this submission, like, moves her body somehow she shifted her body around diana and locked in a cross face she basically countered her submission with another submission into a cross face it was dope so now diana's caught up in the submission she's trying to fight out of it she manages to get herself out of it somehow um eo gets her down and lord jesus uh this had to be the uh the um how do I say this? You know, moonsaults are a very uh, unique thing because you have to go to the top rope or wherever you're doing it from, and you have to launch yourself, not knowing exactly where you're going to land, but it takes a lot of precision to land a moonsault. Io Sarai, she does the Asai moonsault, which is basically just you're going to the top rope and you're long. It's it's a moonsault. It's a moonsault onto your opponent. Sarai does it all the time. We, we see her do it all the time. Io Sarai, her moonsault, she kind of does like a... I call it a swan dive when they have their arms out when they do what they do a dive. I call it a swan dive. I don't know about y'all, but that's what I call it. She she does her swan dive like moonsault. 
But this time around, I guess she she must have over. I don't know if Deanna was too close. I don't think Deanna was too close. I think Io just overshot. And now that just shows you how far and how agile this woman is. The fact that she could go that far into the middle of the ring. But she basically goes for Moonsault and she overshot. She did not hit Deanna at all. Now, she got like her hands. Her hands. <laughs> her forearms. Her wrists. That hit Deanna. But her body... Her, 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 every, nothing else aside from her hands hit Deanna Perrazzo. She almost, she basically completely missed the moonsault and went for the pin, and that was it. And I was like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we, we kind of realized, we kind of, we, everyone, everyone clear as day saw that Io Shirai missed that moonsault. I wish they would have improvised something. Like maybe I, you know, I guess they didn't want to. They didn't want to uh, have Deanna kick out of the moon. So I guess they're saving that for the final round or whatever. But still, like, come on now. Deanna had to have known that she did not get hit. He, of course, she had known. Like she would have. She would have felt all that body weight going on her. But like she felt that little from a probably Eo's hand and thought, okay, she hit me. I'll sell it anyway. I don't understand why they couldn't kick out of this. But I thought it was a whack ass finish. Good match, whack ass finish. Now Cole, credit to him, he tried to he tried to uh, cover it up by saying, "Oh well, all the damage done to Deanna Peraza over the course of the match, um, basically had her winded from that from the impact of the form of the move." I don't know what kind of BS excuse he gave. I, I can't remember the exact BS excuse he gave, but he tried his best to cover it up. No matter how you shape this, it looked like EO basically punched. Deanna in the gut and got the win off of it. <laughs> and you know they, they messed up because there was no replay shown at all. It was just uh, awkward two women just getting up from the ring and then they she raised Eo's hand. Even when she hit the moonsault, the crowd was just like, they were like, uh, okay. They they kind of just ignored it, but I'm not going to ignore it. That was kind of, they, they could have kicked that. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know, it just makes me upset when I see good matches like that go to waste over a shitty finish. And I know it's not... I mean, it kind of is their fault, but you you guys get the point. I'm not going to talk, talk too much about it. Io Shirai wins the match. Then we get on to the next match. And this one was just... Man, tearjerker here for some people. Tiga Knox versus Rhea Ripley. Now, the story for Tiga Knox... Now, I've said that I don't see what's so special about Tiga Knox in my previous review. I, I still don't. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, Tika Knox is this great wrestler now that she, what happened to her. But I didn't see what was so impressive about her. I'd not say she was bad, but I just didn't see, you know, the limelight in this woman. But, you know, she had that story behind her that she was supposed to be in a first man classic, but then she got hurt. She tore ACL. She couldn't be in it. So basically, she had a comeback story. Like, she's going to the second man classic with the uh, ACL repairment. And that's been kind of the story. I've kind of been not paying attention to it until this match. So when this happened, I'm just like, this is terrible timing. This is just, that's, so, ba okay. So basically what happens is, very early in the match, Tika Knox, go, I mean like first 15, 20 seconds of the match. Tika Knox go for a suicide dive onto Rhea Ripley, and she lands awkwardly onto her. Now, it didn't look like she landed awkwardly, but we could tell she landed awkwardly because when she lands, she rolls over and she's like beating on the floor. She hits the she hits the steps all hard, and we're like, oh shit, she hurt herself. Referee's going to check because she she looks like she's legitimately hurt. Like, you know, we're wrestling fans. We know that most of the time when it's selling, they're not actually hurt. But when you you could when you're you could honestly look on someone's face and tell that oh my god they look like they're really hurt. And the referee saw this. She runs over to Tegan. Tegan's like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. She's like, no, you're not. And she's like, I swear, I'm fine. And I could do this. She gets in the ring. She does like I think one or two more moves, and then like she's limping. Like she's limping from here, from place to place. Referee's like, you're not fine. She puts up the X, and everyone's like, oh shit. And Tegan's like telling her up and down, like, I can do this. I'm fine. The officials come over. Ray Ripley's standing in the corner, like, mm, whatever. But she, like, two officials come down to the ring, and every, commentators stop talking. I'm like, oh shit, this is real. Like, this, this, this ain't like a plant. This is, this is, she really hurt herself. At this point, the fans know this is, this isn't fake. So, officials come down. Tegan's like, I swear to God, I can go. I can do this. 
and I, I get I I'm getting the gist that basically they're saying, you know, we're gonna take you to the back and she's like, No, I can finish the match. That's basically the gist I'm getting from this. So she says this and they're giving her the okay. She goes for like a one more minute, hits a drop kick onto Rhea Ripley. Next thing you know, Tegan puts up the X and she's on the ground. She is crying. She is just in tears, like clutching her knee, and it just looks terrible. And the crowd goes dead silent. Now, I've said before in many reviews that the crowd is dead. The crowd's silent. You can hear a pin drop. I have never heard a crowd so silent in the years I've watched wrestling. Like, I cannot hear a single thing except for Tegan Knox crying. And that just made that just made it so much more upset. So much more sad than Atsy was. Was just nothing but hearing her cry as the officials were coming down to help her. That was that was very uh, depressing to see. And hear, honestly. And the crowd was silent for like a whole like 30 seconds before like... Uh, they were silent up until the ring announcer announced that uh, basically Tegan Knox uh, couldn't compete anymore. And that Rhea Ripley wins the match by Matt Stoppage. So she's like... Officials are helping her. Referee's helping her out. She's crying. Now the crowd's clapping. They're clapping for a while. They're like, thank you, Tika. And listen, I know they're trying to be supportive and whatnot, but I feel like the worst thing you probably could chant is thank you, Tegan, as if she's retired. Thank you means like, you know, they're retiring or this is their last. Matt, like, I feel like when you say thank you to a wrestler, this is this is might be their last match. You know? I probably would not have chanted that to someone who just hurt themselves. Legitimately. Like I don't know about I don't know about y'all, but I felt like that was that was not the right time to chant that. I just felt like it was kind of disrespectful. But you know, they were trying to be supportive. I don't think it works. I don't think it was the right time to do that. So they're clapping. Well, not with clapping is fine. The chant was not. And she's being walked to the back. Rhea Ripley wins. That was kind of the end of the match. Match ended on that note. Very depressing. But Rhea Ripley will be going on to face um, Io Shirai. If I'm correct. Yes, she will be facing Io Shirai, which that sh should be amazing. I cannot wait for Io Shirai versus Rhea Ripley. But, uh, yeah, hopefully Tegan Knox gets a better. Now, she did not hurt the leg that was already injured. She hurt her other leg. She hurt her other knee, which is worse. Because it's, it's bad enough that you hurt your left knee, but then you come into the classic and you hurt your right knee. So now both of your knees are like that. That's just terrible. So I hope the woman gets better and she makes a speedy recovery. Now, I know ECLs, they, you be out for a very long time. So hopefully we can see her back by like maybe 2019, 2020, whenever. Hopefully she gets back in NXT or the next May Young Classic 3 or 4, whatever. So hope the best for her. That kind of put a damper on the mood for the next match, not going to lie. I mean, the next match was good, but I felt like with that happening, it was kind of hard to you know, get back into that mindset. The crowd was getting into it kind of towards the end they did, but like in the beginning they were kind of, you know. But anyway, we get into the uh, main event, Tony Storm versus Mia Yim. It was, like I said, it was good, but I felt like the previous segment kind of overshadowed it to the point where like the first half kind of was a blur. But uh, to skip through, they did have some good spots in here. Uh, it was kind of paint by numbers, you know. Mia Yim gets control. Tony Storm comes back, and Mia Yim starts to get her thing in. She goes for soul food, but uh, Tony Storm counters it, grabs the hand of Mia Yim. Tony Storm sends her into a German suplex. By the way, Tony Storm's German suplexes are some of the best, especially when she performs on Ginny. Straight to a German suplex, and then after that, follows it up with Storm Zero for the pin. Tony Storm winning the match and will be going on to face Mako Satomura in the semifinals. That should also be an amazing match. So as it stands right now, guys, semifinals looks to be Mako Satomura versus Tony Storm and Io Shirai versus Rhea Ripley. Could not ask for any better of a Final Four than that, honestly. Now, from the way it looks, as I'm looking at it now, I feel like it was probably meant to be Tegan Knox versus Mako Satomura. Maybe. I don't know. I felt like maybe Tegan was supposed to win that match. I'm not sure. But yeah, guys, that was your review of the Mayon Classic as we're going into next week's semifinal round. Can't wait for it. I'm still just a little bit upset about the whole Tegan Knox thing, honestly. That was just really depressing. But 
yeah, guys, thank you all for listening again. Love you guys always. And uh, tune in for next Wednesday's episode before that is, I believe that's the last episode of the Man Classic. And then the finals take place at um, Evolution. Not the not the faction, the pay per view that that would be tends to forget about in place of Crown Jewel. Anyway, thank you all for listening again. Love you guys always, and I'll talk to you all later. Peace out.